everyone and welcome to this bonus episode for season four. Thank you so much for joining me this season. It's been amazing. We've had some incredible guests. It's so wonderful to have you part of the village and I'm so grateful to the questions that you've emailed or you've sent through to my page. And so what I'm going to do now is we are going to tackle some of those. I don't really like my teen's friendship group. What should I do? So what I'm thinking is that this listener has noticed some signs in their teenager. So usually what we see are things like grades dropping, a bit more disinterest in schoolwork or homework. You might have been contacted by the school. There might be changes in your teen's attitude. They might seem a little bit more defensive or a bit moody. Sometimes they tend to even lie about where they are or what they're doing. You might even be worried that they're experimenting with drugs or you might smell smoke on their clothes or find vapes in their drawers. And then you also wonder, are they rejecting my family values? Do they seem to have different values to me? And, and you're not quite sure about how you feel about that. So all of these signs can feel really unsettling to parents. This is a really tricky topic for us as parents because there's nothing harder for us than seeing our child change and we're not really sure what we think about some of those changes. And unless a friend poses an actual danger for your teen, we've got to tread quite lightly around this topic. We all know that our teens' brains are still developing, so they're still learning to make decisions around uh, skills, around peer pressure. Peer pressure is so hard at this age, and we've got to try and think about what was it like for me as a teenager. Then we've got to look at how do I handle and communicate with my teenager in this situation around their friendships. Because in the long term, this is going to have consequences on your relationship with your teenager. We've also got to find the balance in helping them learn from some of the mistakes that they've made, but also keep them safe. You don't want to make things worse by pushing your teen further away from you because you just appear critical. So it's important, especially not to blame your teen's behavior only on their peers. That can kind of feel like the easy out for you as a parent thinking, well, it must be the friend's fault for the way my child is behaving. Sometimes our teens make bad choices themselves. It's also important to remember that our teens really just want to feel like they belong. They want acceptance. And so what they do is, is they adopt behaviors of those around them, particularly their peers. So they might change their taste in music or fashion choices. If you think back, a lot of us or my generation had mullets. I mean, isn't it hysterical that mullets are back? And our parents hated them at the time. And it's just because we wanted to fit in. Some of our teens prefer that their parents don't approve of their friends. And why is this? Because they want to separate from us. They want to be individuals. They want to develop autonomy. It's a very normal and natural part of the teenage years. So unless it's something dangerous and it's just something like a hairstyle, those might be things we need to just let go. It's also important to avoid certain things. So avoid being judgmental. If we remain non-judgmental and go back to open-ended, curious questions about what might be going on for our young people, because remember that we don't know what is going on for them. Perhaps your teen has been sitting alone at school for weeks and suddenly this group of young people are the ones that included them and they suddenly have their group around them. Choosing the group rather than sitting alone is, is the one that they're going to choose. Also remember, don't constantly badmouth their friends. This is the surest way of pushing our teens away from us. Their peer relationships are so important. And when we badmouth our teens' friends, what they, they have to do then automatically is defend themselves, defend their own choices and the reasons why they have these friends. What it also does to them is it reinforces that you completely must not understand them. You don't understand their friends. You don't understand their generation. And so they feel much more separated from you and that you're not interested in their world. So what can we do? 
I think as parents, it's so important for our home to be the safe place. The safe place for our teens where they can chill and relax and be themselves. It's not a place of constant criticism, but also a safe place for their friends. The place that you welcome other teenagers. Some of those teens may need good role models themselves. Be the house where there's food and a place where young people can chill. And you can also get, keep an eye on what's going on in the friendships. Keep your family life as a priority. That is still so important for our teenagers. Be kind to your teens. Remember, sarcasm and criticism will just push them away. Have a chat with them about what makes a good friend. What does a good friend look like compared to what is a toxic friend or a toxic relationship? The tricky thing may be when you see your child being in a friendship group that is critical and unkind to them. So what we often do in situations like that is continue modeling kindness and empathy in your own home, that your home is still a safe place for them to be around and then encourage them to be part of a variety of social situations, school activities, outside activities, sports, uh, neighborhoods, family, friends, where they aren't just relying on that one group or that one toxic person for their connections. Also get to know other parents. That's kind of like your superpower. I know your teenagers will probably roll their eyes at it and they will hate the fact that you will walk them into parties, particularly when they're, they're young teens and you're trying to see and get to know other parents. I know I've relied on the parents of my children's friends. The two of us will often bounce off each other and look out for each other's children. It's also important to still have clear expectations of your teens, even though you may not approve of some of their behaviors or their values might, might be shifting or changing or they're trying out new things. Clear expectations and clear boundaries for our teens are so important. Our boundaries are what make our teens still feel safe. Boundaries still communicate love. And it's also important for us to be vulnerable with our teens, where we share some of the pains we had as young people and how we remembered it was difficult to fit in and wondering what the social group is doing. Now, when I talk about being vulnerable, what I mean is normalizing certain things that many teenagers go through, not sharing some of our deepest pain. Some of our deepest pain will come out when we are parenting our own teenagers because it brings back memories. Those things might be the things that you keep for a professional yourself. If you're really worried about your teen and there's dangerous behavior, please seek professional support. But above all, maintain connection with your teen. In the long term, that is what's going to matter. How do I talk about difficult topics, especially those that we haven't brought up before? So I'm going to assume that Joe means topics like sex or drugs or pornography or alcohol that you haven't spoken to your teenager about before. It's so important to have discussions early on with our teens. That way we are protective rather than reactive when something comes up. Our teens need something to fall back on when they're in the heat of the moment or something goes wrong. They need to be able to draw on information that's already there in their brain. So you need to be talking about these topics because it's so important that topics don't appear taboo in your home. You need to make them normal. Our teens register the topics that are off limits by what we don't talk about. And so we need to make these really normal for our teens. Our teens are always communicating with us. So look out for body language or facial expressions or kind of proximity when they hanging in the area. Then we also look for everyday opportunities, news stories or movies or music. And those opportunities will give us options to talk often. None of our big topics like sex or pornography or alcohol need to be these one-off serious conversations in the fancy lounge room. They need to be conversations that we are having day to day or when they come up. What we can also do is ask our teens what they have noticed around school or what they've heard other people talking about on this topic. So ask them, what do your friends think? You will have heard me and others say this on the podcast often, rather than our teens feeling like they're in an interrogation with you. They feel as though we're talking about other people and it seems to just settle things down and make it a general conversation. Also expect eye rolls and shrugging and sighs or I don't know. That's okay. That's very normal. Sometimes our teens need some time to think 
or they might feel completely uncomfortable. It's okay to feel uncomfortable in front of your parents when your parents are talking about something tricky. Make sure you choose appropriate time and place. So we're talking about things like no eye contact often works well for many teens. So times when you're both active, kicking a ball, or you're both cooking, uh, or you're out in the garden, sometimes in the car, sitting side by side. Something else that's important to do is tell your teen that you won't ban technology if they come to talk to you about something they've seen online. That is one of our teen's biggest fears, that you are going to take away their devices as soon as they tell you that they've seen something inappropriate. They need to know that you're a safe place, that you're going to guide them through some of these tricky areas, that you're not going to completely shut them down or shut them off from their friends just because they've been brave enough to come and ask you something likely something they're really embarrassed about. Also remember some of the topics that we communicate as taboo are because our teens don't hear us talk about them, they are not going to come and ask us first. We need to be again proactive in raising some of the topics. You can also say to your teens, you know what, some of these topics my parents never brought up with me. And so I'm still learning how to do this and how to do this well. And it is going to feel a bit weird for us, but I love you and these topics are important that they come from me rather than the media or, for, or from your friends. So much research tells us that our teens know that their friends are tuning into the same broken sources as they are and so they actually want their parents advice. So what we need to do is look out for lots of opportunities to bring up topics, chat about things, make them normal in our homes, that we become that safe place for our teens to come when they have a question. How can I help my teen handle disappointment and not get overwhelmed myself? There's a saying that says, you are only as happy as your most unhappy child. And what that says to me is that we carry our children's pain so acutely as parents, and that is so normal. Try to remember what it felt like being a teenager when our teenagers are overwhelmed but with huge emotion and disappointments. But also sometimes looking at our teen's pain might be bringing up painful memories of our own. And that might be why we are feeling overwhelmed. So what we need to do is process some of our own pain away from our child and then practice your calm face when you are in front of your teen. Because overreactions are the biggest thing that shut down communication. If our teens think we are going to totally freak out, they won't come to us again. I've had so many teens say to me, I don't want to upset my mum, so I won't tell her. Our job is to listen first. Don't talk first, listen first. When our teen comes to us, when they feel overwhelmed or they feel in pain or they feel disappointed, what we do is we listen and this makes them feel heard. This teaches empathy and it also teaches our teens that their feelings won't swallow them whole. They actually can survive hard feelings and difficult feelings. We also need to try as parents, I know I'm talking to myself, not to fix things all the time and not to always have a lesson in everything. Our kids need to know that they have been heard by us. Sometimes they just want to vent. They don't want advice. So when you do talk to your teen, ask questions. Ask more questions and ask more questions. When you ask them a question, give them some time to think about it. Even if they don't come up with the answer themselves initially, they, this actually gets their thought processes going. Ask them things like, why do you feel like this is so disappointing for you? What do you think this is bringing up for you? We almost need to dig underneath the question. Sometimes they might say, well, I'm so disappointed I wasn't made a prefect. And you might say to them, what is going on for you underneath that? Perhaps they're worried about popularity or they feel like they weren't good enough or they don't measure up enough. Then we also talk about why is popularity important to you or what does good enough look like to you? Something else to ask your teenager is, did you have realistic expectations? Now, obviously we ask that in a kind way. One thing I can't stand is your child can be anything they want to be. Clearly our children can't be anything they want to be, but we don't mean that in an unkind way. We're really looking for what skills do our children have and then we encourage them in those. And sometimes our children may be aiming a little bit more than what they're able to do right at the moment. 
But even if they did have realistic expectations, sometimes life is unfair. Sometimes the coach doesn't pick the person who who we feel deserved it who, or who was good enough. Sometimes we need to help our teens to handle disappointments because they're going to face these eventually in their lives in other settings and teach them that you can move forward after disappointments. So you can also help them see the difference between something that might feel like injustice, but also sometimes there's a natural consequence. Sometimes there's a bit of a combination of of a few things. So an example of a consequence would be your teen is really frustrated that they failed their driver's test. But what the driving instructor noticed was they were a little bit unsafe going around the traffic circle. And so they don't want your teen to be on the road yet until they are a safe driver. And that is still disappointing for your teen. So it's important for our teens to understand that there's a difference between a failure and being a failure. So helping our teens to tap into those sources of happiness or satisfaction that comes from areas that bring them hope, something that's strong and reliable, things like love and faith, rather than things just like popularity. Remember to give your child a lot of affirmation. Disappointments happen but they should never alter your child's belief that you love them and that they are worthy no matter what they do or what they achieve. So as hard as disappointments are, they can be great learning experiences for our teens as they grow. We're going to have some good topics on that in season five. Thank you so much for the incredible questions that you sent me. I'm so enjoying the questions that are coming in because we're all learning together. There are some incredible topics coming up and some fabulous guests in season five. So stay tuned in the next few weeks.